Welcome back. As we've been talking about all afternoon, President Donald Trump signed a new executive order banning travel for immigrants from several countries. It does not take effect until March 16th and is smaller in scope than the original signed back in January. Iraq has been removed after its leaders launched diplomatic protests, but six majority Muslim countries remain, including Syria, Yemen, Sudan, Libya, Iran, and Somalia. Mark Doss is a supervising attorney and fellow at the International Refugee Assistance Project at the Urban Justice Center. And Nahal Tusi is Politico's foreign affairs correspondent, and she joins us from Arlington. All right, so Nahal, to you first. This new travel ban was pushed back multiple times. Was this a matter of getting it right? And if so, did they? Well, it depends on the eye of the beholder. Uh, there were so many legal challenges on so many different parts of the order that it was clear that the Trump administration had a lot of changes that it felt it needed to make. Now, they insist that the original order was perfectly legally fine, but there are plenty of people who will point to this order and say that they did make a lot of changes that are going to make it uh, more justifiable to the courts, even though there's no guarantee this one will survive the courts either. Mm. Mark, you were at JFK Airport after the first travel ban went into effect. What have you been dealing with since? You know, this order is still unconstitutional, this revised order. Um, it is smaller in scope, but it still affects um, individuals coming from Muslim countries, and it still affects tens of thousands of refugees, including Iraqis. My client at JFK was Iraqi. He was on an immigrant visa, but we have tons of clients um, at IRAP where uh, they are refugees because they worked alongside the United States, and they've been persecuted for that work, and now they can't come in still under this revised executive order. I'm going to ask both of you this, starting with Mark, uh, and, uh, to frame this for us. Is it your contention that this is still a ban on Muslims in this country? Absolutely. This is still a discriminatory uh, ban. It's still uh, not going to survive in the courts. Just because it takes off Iraq from the countries does not change um, everything that um, the president had said in the campaign and after the campaign um, about uh, preventing Muslims from coming into this country. Nahal, one of the things that the, uh, the Trump administration has struggled with is the perception that this is a ban on Muslims and even the uh, judges that were deciding in the original travel ban what to do had that contention that because of some of the rhetoric that Mr. Trump used on the campaign trail, this was in effect a travel ban. Does this new order remove that allegation, if you will? Uh, well, there's no language in it anymore that gives preference to certain religious minorities. Uh, and so it does seem on the surface of it not to necessarily target a particular religious group. That being said, it does also seem to disproportionately affect Muslim countries. Uh, but there are a lot of pieces to this, and it's kind of a moving, uh, a moving thing. For instance, uh, all countries are going to be facing a review of their relations with the United States on visas, every single country in the world. So it's entirely possible that if there are other countries countries that the United States feels don't meet the requirements that it wants on helping us get information about their, their, their foreign citizens coming to visit the United States, that they too could be added to the list. So in a way, um, it's going to have to still play out. But at this moment, it does seem to disproportionately affect Muslims. And Nahal, a leaked DHS report disputed the threat of people from these countries. So how do you expect the administration uh, to argue this order going forward? Well, for instance, the administration today uh, says that, that the FBI it has 300 people under investigation, terrorism-related investigations, uh, who happen to come to the United States as refugees. But it was so vague, and it would not give us any details about these 300. So we don't know if most of them came from came to the United States when they were children. We don't know what countries they came from as refugees. We don't know what they mean by an FBI investigation. We don't know what they mean by terrorism related. So it seems like the administration is going to put forward some statistics to try to prove its assertion that refugees, for instance, pose a lot of risk. Uh, but it's really questionable. If they don't give more details about these 300, then it's, it's just really hard to tell what they're trying to do. And I think a lot of judges will look at that with some skepticism. Mark, you just saw our interview with a young 21-year-old filmmaker uh, her brother-in-law, who's the highest-ranking Yemeni American in the NYPD. Uh, who are typically your clients? I don't want you to generalize, overgeneralize, but give us a sense of the people that you're defending, where they came from, their circumstances. We have clients from countries all over the world, and they're individuals who have fled persecution uh, because they have been targeted by terrorists. They have been targeted by groups like ISIS, by Al-Qaeda. 
they are, they are not terrorists. They are ones that are being terrorized. And so these are individuals who are looking for safety. They're looking to come to the United States for a new chance, a new start. And so these are people that should not be uh, uh, prevented from coming into the country. They've gone through rigorous screening processes, um, very intense and thorough uh, background checks and security checks, biometrics, um, the works. You know, you can't just say, I'm a refugee and getting on the next plane to the United States. And so to ban these individuals is really just feeding into the narrative that ISIS wants, that America is against Islam, that America hates Muslims. So this actually is harming our national security. It's something that we've heard uh, before uh, from other uh, intelligence officials, uh, former intelligence officers, uh, what Mark is saying. And I also wonder, uh, when we talk about this, the refugees that are coming into this country, most Americans may not realize, as Mark points out, that there's already a very stringent process in place for these folks to get in. But I'm curious about Iraq being removed from this list, because to, in a lot of people's eyes, the fact that one country was able to successfully lobby the Trump administration for removal off that, sli uh, off that list does it give the sense that the list is arbitrary? That's right. Uh, there is the sense of arbitrariness. Iraq, you know, basically said, look, we're your partners in the fight against uh, the Islamic State. You have troops based in our country. Why are you treating us this way? And that argument goes a long way. Um, but then there's other countries, for instance, Saudi Arabia, uh, who have very strong lobbying networks in Washington. And yet their citizens have been implicated on a number of terrorist attacks against U.S. citizens. But Saudi Arabia is not targeted in this order. So, yes, there are definitely elements of this that seem arbitrary. and. Uh, when we ask the administration about it, they, they just simply say, well, you know what, this list could expand in the future. We don't know, but this is what we're starting with now. And Vlad, if I could just add yeah. to that, um, you know, just the, the logic of this executive order just makes no sense. Um, you know, Iraq was on the list, and now it's been taken off. Um, it, it's completely arbitrary, and what it is is politics. And, you know, what uh, actually happens is that people's lives are in danger. Um, so Iraq was taken off the immigrant visa list, but we still have Iraqi refugees who are not allowed to enter the United States. Tens of thousands of refugees cannot come into the United States because they've actually lowered the cap from 110,000 refugees just to 50,000. And so when you start uh, getting into politics, you're actually endangering people's lives. The president has called because we just talked about the fact that there are already rigorous vetting measures in place, but the president has suggested that this is going to be extreme vetting. What does that mean to you? I think it's just political rhetoric, political rhetoric just trying to appease his base. Um, you know, refugees go through over two years of vetting from every major agency, the CIA, the FBI, the National Counterterrorism Center, Department of Homeland Security, De Department of Defense. You know, I could just keep listing agencies. Um, we have clients who have waited over five years to, be, to get their visas to get to the United States. There is no more extreme vetting that you can already have. And so this is just political posturing, and what it's doing is endangering the lives of incredibly vulnerable individuals who are just trying to come to the United States for safety. But, and yet, Nahal, uh, when we talk about political rhetoric, as Mark is suggesting there, uh, look, President Trump campaigned on this very issue. This is one of the things that propelled him to the Oval Office. The people that supported him, that voted for him, heard him on the campaign trail say over and over again that uh, the United States was at war with what he called radical Islamic terrorism. He suggested that President Obama and uh, Secretary Hillary Clinton refused to use that terminology and that if he were elected president of the United States, he was going to implement much what we see today. Um, and so given that, that's what the majority of the people who voted for him want to see. I guess the president is arguing, look, I'm doing the job that the American people sent me here to do. It is absolutely fascinating to watch a politician actually keep his promises. I, I agree on that front. Uh, but that being said, it, it kind of, again, goes back to the logic of this. Why these particular countries? If you're really worried about radical Islamist terrorism, uh, then why not include Pakistan on the list? Why not include Afghanistan on the list? Uh, otherwise, it's it just, that's the thing. It's one thing to say you're going to keep the promise, but then to uh, give in to uh, lobbying, say, by the Iraqis. So uh, at the end of the day, the question is, does this really keep Americans safer or not? And to be honest, we might just have to wait and see for a while. And the first time that there's a terrorist attack by somebody from a different country that's not on this list, these questions are going to come up.
Absolutely. And if I could just say, it does not keep America safe. This order goes against our national security interests. This is playing right into the hands of ISIS, and this is not a message that we want to be sending to the rest of the world. Uh, it's an interesting discussion, I think one that we're going to be having over the next couple of weeks, if not months, if perhaps not even years. Uh, Nahal Tusi at Politico, Mark Das, thank you very much for stopping by. We appreciate it. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks for having us.